Hello, Chris Anderson here. I have some good news. Our third season is coming your way soon. It premieres on October 9th, and we have a really exciting list of speakers coming up, starting with the psychologist Daniel Gilbert, consciousness researcher Anil Seth, and the wonderful author Elif Shafak. Today, we're sharing a bonus episode recorded earlier this year, and here we go. Hello there, this is Chris Anderson. Welcome to the TED Interview, the podcast series where I get to sit down with a TED speaker and just dive much deeper into their ideas than is possible during a short TED talk. Today on the show, Parag Khanna and a different way to think about globalism. Parag doesn't look at a map the way most people do. He doesn't see a world of 200 countries defined by their sovereign borders. He sees a world of physical connections that, more often than not, transcend those borders. Megacities connected by roads, railways, trade routes, fiber optic cables. This is what he calls connectography. Connectography represents a quantum leap in the mobility of people, resources, ideas. But it is an evolution, an evolution of the world from political geography, which is how we legally divide the world, to functional geography, which is how we actually use the world. Parag advocates that this kind of thinking will revolutionize how countries and governments organize themselves in the future, that continued globalization is absolutely essential, and that the centers of influence are shifting profoundly and irreversibly to the East. Parag and I had a wide-ranging conversation on the implications of this worldview and whether it can survive the current pushback against globalism in all its forms. It's rare you meet someone who's so certain of his views. I almost thought he was going to start pounding the table at one point. At any rate, for anyone trying to understand what is coming, the issues Parag raises are absolutely key. So without further ado, Parag Khanna. So, Parag, welcome. Thanks so much, Chris. So we're going to have a delicious conversation, I think really about how to think about the world. Um, Quite an important topic. Um, (laughs) Or approach, yeah. (laughs) Well, indeed. I think this affects not just, you know, how we read the news, um, how we understand or think about the future. I mean, it goes to things about, do we feel hopeful about what's to come or do we dread it? But before we go there, I just want to go back a bit to you, because I think Um, there was an incident of you as a teenager that helped shape some of your worldview. Tell me about that. Oh, not an incident, but I would say a world historical event. When the Berlin Wall fell, November 9th, 1989, for my parents, my dad had visited Germany a number of times and, and even lived there as an exchange student on a business kind of apprenticeship. And he and my mom took my brother and me, got on a plane, and we flew to Germany. And we Hmm. went to Berlin. And as you know, Chris, the Berlin Wall was actually 100-something kilometers of concrete. It wasn't just that one slab in front of the Brandenburg Gate where Ronald Reagan went and stood and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall a few years earlier. It was big. So it was still there, of course. You know, it took years to take it all down. So I got my hammer and my chisel, uh, rented one for five Deutschmarks, and I hammered away. And I took pieces back and distributed them to the eighth grade class. Basically, that moment, everything that I've done since in the last, you know, let's say 30 years, kind of comes back to that day. Because what was going on in your head was something like, this border clearly made no sense. This was crazy. This was this was blocking so much that shouldn't have been blocked. That would be like the kind of moral insight that I didn't have at the time. <laughs> uh, it was more that I am getting to live geopolitical change. And geopolitical change, geopolitical complexity, like I said, is, is everything that I do. It's what I eat, sleep, and breathe. It's all I care about. My life's work can be described in the words geopolitical complexity. That's what I'm out to do. Tell us about that. Sure. Maybe many people take for granted that they think that the most fundamental way of organizing ourselves is according to nations and and borders. But that wouldn't be true necessarily of young people, you know, the age of, in this case, you know, my children or, uh, you know, the, the global youth. They really have a different outlook. And to me, what I'm saying should be fairly obvious to them, that connectivity and connectedness and your degree of connectedness, whether it's digital or physical, your ease of mobility by airlines or you know how many Facebook friends you have, whatever, is as much a part of who you are and who you feel you are 
than the country you live in and the arbitrary notion that your ethnicity or your nationality defines you entirely. One of the striking things you you did in your talk was just say, well, hello, just take a look at the world from space. Look at the satellite's eye view of the world. What do you see? You do not see political borders. What, What do you see? What you see largely is connectivity. You see urbanization. You see cities. The fact that the majority of the world population lives in cities, the satellite map of the world or the astronaut's view of the world shows you those lights at night. That really represents not only how we have voluntarily decided to distribute ourselves around the world, which is to say to live in cities and to live near bodies of water. You know, the latter being a biological necessity, the former being a a human uh, choice. And one of the, the things that I think is deep in the message that I, again, think is fairly normal is that, you know, connectivity to other people is deeply part of who we are. And now we physically are doing it. We are, you can map it and show how important the infrastructures are to make human life as it is possible. And so I think you were arguing that, you know, when you, when you look at a, a political border, I mean, in a way that, that divides, you know, two territories, but that more significant than that border are the number of things that are crossing it. And yes. you, you pointed to lots of things from, well, there are roads, there are rail lines, you know, there are, there are fiber optic cables right. that allow, you know, massive amounts of communication. There's, there's airplanes shuttling people to and fro. Right. And that the more significant thing to look at, just an understanding, it's like you might have two big cities on opposite sides of a border right. that are inherently linked in how they they work together, that their lives are dependent on the life of the other city. Totally. Like, is it it really economic trade that has been the biggest driver of these connections between territories? Well, very, very often, yes. It could also be, though, ethnic kinship. So the notion that, you know, ethnicity and the tribe defines who you are and therefore your neighbor is the other is not actually true, Chris, for the majority of the world's population because, as you well know, so many borders are arbitrary that they cut ethnicities off from each other. As you know, my wife is from Pakistan and I'm from India. We're both Punjabi. My family fled from so-called Pakistan to India when it was created in 1947. Her family fled from India to Pakistan. We're identical people. So again, the notion that that other is actually different is ludicrous. It's the border that is so fake and arbitrary because it divided that unit that we think of as so fundamental. So borders are criminal in, in two ways in that sense. So so this worldview, certainly as expressed in that TED Talk from 2016, it was a pretty optimistic view, I would say. But since that talk, there have been two, I would say, you know, like giant challenges to that worldview. You know, the rise of anti-globalization mindsets. Mm -hmm. They were always there, but a lot of us didn't pay enough attention to them. And um, Brexit, the rise of Trump, et cetera, like that really challenged the sense that this was unstoppable, that this was an unalloyed uh, good Mm. thing. And then the second one is what's happened to technology itself, where where there's been a real shift in public opinion about, you know, the the sort of the dark side of technology. I'd kind of love to to hear your your thoughts on, on both those pushbacks. I mean, the first is the easiest and most open and shut case to deal with because there is no such thing, Chris, as an actual anti-globalization movement. You may call it that. Trump may call it that. He may say, I'm a you know, nationalist, not a globalist. People may write books about it. False. There was a so-called anti-globalization movement in the 1990s, right? Those were the people who were protesting against uh, the World Trade Organization, further global trade liberalization, and this kind of thing. That is not what you see today. Let's be absolutely clear that Trump and Brexit are about criticizing and protesting the failure of their own governments to manage globalization. They are not anti-globalization. The the soybean farmers of America, the lobster exporters of America, the microchip and semiconductor exporters of America, you name it, are not against globalization. No one wants a more expensive pair of jeans or a more expensive iPhone, right? Right. But but people do want jobs. If you take the world and you connect it with all these incredibly low friction things like fiber optic cables, like container ships, like, you know, what you are doing, deliberately or not, is you are making it possible for someone 8,000 miles away to take your job because they can do what you were doing much more efficiently and then and then send it to your country. I mean, that has been a powerful driver of resentment. I mean, hasn't there actually been a transfer of jobs from America, from the West, to parts of Asia especially? 
let's take worker X in America who lost his job in an automobile plant because it was outsourced to Thailand and worker Y in Germany to whom the exact same thing happened. Why is it that the worker X voted for Trump and, and is unemployed? Worker Y in Germany is happily working in another job. Uh, he was upskilled by the government in between. The difference between the two is not that one is smarter than the other, because obviously the self-defeating, hyper-nationalist, isolationist policies of Trump are not anything that people look up to in other governments of the world. And meanwhile, there's still that unemployed guy. Which government would you rather have as your government? The one that invested in reskilling its workers or the one that didn't? Because we can go back, Chris, to the 1970s, when governments started investing in trade adjustment assistance for their workers, and we can measure exactly which governments did it and which governments spend 2 to 3% of their budget on it the way countries like Denmark do versus those that spend nothing on it which is the United States government. So again, whose fault is it? It is not China's fault. It is not Thailand's fault. It is Washington's fault. And so if I were that unemployed guy in Detroit, I would vote for Trump too. I absolutely would, but it's not because I hate China. It's because I'm so mad that for 40 years, no one trained me to do a new job. Right, but but I, th- I, I still think it's fair to say that many people missed the level of fear and anger that was building as a result of this sort of massive sort of um, shift in in how the world's workforces were organized. You can understand why it's perceived by many people as this dangerous, scary force. I not only understand it, I have deep sympathies for it, which is why (laughs) I and and people far more, you know, plugged in and influential and focused on the issue than I am, advocate the correct remedies and policies, none of which involve uh, placing, you know, tariffs on Chinese goods that therefore raise the cost to those unemployed people to buy stuff at Walmart, right? It's counterproductive in every possible respect. I think that someone who's lost their job actually knows who is to blame, by the way. They may go to a Trump rally because they blame, you know, previous administrations, plural, for not having done the things that are needed for them to to maintain a high standard of living. And by the way, I'm not for unalloyed, unfiltered free markets and globalization. The central operating principle in my work is what I call flow versus friction. And every country has to figure out what's the right volume or right degree of flow and friction in every category of its foreign relations. And America has gotten a lot of those right by advocating for free trade. It's helped its companies be the greatest beneficiaries. I mean, what are the largest companies in the world after all, Chris, right? Uh, They're American technology firms and financial institutions. But it is the job of the American government to figure out how to redistribute that, how to tax that, how to do investment and savings. And not all countries do it as badly as America and as Britain have. But in addition to the economic piece, there are legitimate concerns around how fast cultures can integrate? Like, how wise is it to have wide open borders, you know, mass immigration and so forth, given how complex humans are, how different our cultural values are? There there are surely legitimate dangers in accelerating that too fast. It's not wise at all to have just unfettered mass immigration. Look at the consequences and the cultural reactions to them. Again, flow and friction. You have to do it in a way such that your population continues to accept it, so to speak. Germany, you know, a place I've lived many times, they were sort of um, applauded for having let in a million refugees uh, in the last couple of years in particular. But then it got to be too much, right? So either you rapidly integrate them in some way, assimilate them, or you don't. But let's also go back to the economic point, which is that every society has a supply and demand issue around demographics. If a country is not giving birth to more children, it's going to need more immigrants. So just because there's an anti-immigrant backlash somewhere, whether it's America or whether it's Germany, that doesn't mean it's the right position to have. So Europe, you know, doesn't have an immigration problem. It has an assimilation problem. By the numbers, it must have more immigrants. It must. The question is, can it assimilate them well, which is really up to it to do. Interesting. Well, let's let's switch to the other globally connecting techno-optimistic world we ran into, which is technology itself. At one point, it was possible to say, hey, you know, Facebook is connecting the world. There's billions of people who have accounts. Suddenly, we can all be friends, can't we? What's your take on, on the big tech pushback that's happened? So first of all, the internet is connecting the world and telephony is connecting the world and Facebook might be one sort of particular barometer or metric of how 
you know, people connect some of the time, right? But uh, it would be inaccurate to use a you know backlash against Facebook, so to speak, as a, a symbol that people are you know, concerned and and don't like technological connectivity, that would be nonsense, right? And part of it is the fact that we do learn so much and we do reduce our costs, right? And have access to global knowledge uh, from being able to be connected without ever having to leave our home. So you can, you know, learn Chinese by just having a, a Skype buddy in China and multiply that by billions. And that's actually what is happening. So again, if you look at Facebook and, you know, a manipulation of fake news and viral uh, rumors that have obviously contributed to the way the U.S. election tipped and even to violent, bloody, murderous campaigns against uh, ethnic minorities in, uh, in India or in Myanmar, part of what is maintaining the support for this technological connectivity um, in, again, the vast majority of the world population is because they can watch and see how we had too much flow and not enough friction, right? Not enough regulation, not enough control, not enough saying, hey, if there's fake news, it has to be taken down immediately. And they're watching that in India, for example, which is having you know the biggest election in the world, uh, as every Indian election is, coming up this year. And they're saying, you know what? We're the biggest country of Facebook users on earth. We clearly benefit from it, just as Facebook. You know what their revenue, uh, you know, sort of revenue growth is in India and Asia? It's, it's extraordinary. But the Indian government has said, if you want to continue to operate here during our election, you better hire hundreds, if not thousands of people to monitor, filter uh, the content on WhatsApp, Facebook, and so forth, so that we don't suffer the downside of this connectivity. So again, flow and friction. Allow the flows, allow the connectivity, allow the conversation, but friction. When it comes to fake news, monitor it, regulate it, delete it. So what the Indian government did there was wise, in your view. I mean, what would be your your advice to the tech companies more, more broadly? There are certain aspects that you have to comply with. If they say that you have to have data localization, right? You have to physically store data. You have to have your servers onshore and so forth. Otherwise, you can't operate in this market. You have to make a decision. You know, is it better to be in that market and to allow for all of the the benefits that accrue, tangible and intangible, to those populations or not? You clearly see most companies are saying, yes, you know, it's better to be in the market than not. An analogy that you or I can also relate to is just, um, you know, publishing. I mean, my books get redacted. They get censored. If I don't accept those redactions or if a tech company doesn't accept uh, the restrictions, then how will it ever get to communicate with those people and allow them to get the additional information that they would otherwise not get? Do you think there'll be that the narrative around technology will shift over the next few years sort of back to more positive, that they will respond in some ways and that people will remember the upside benefits they get from Well, I just have to challenge the assumption because, again, we all ha- experience every day and benefit from the productivity gains, the access to information, and so forth. What you're referring to is that, you know, there is a pile-on effect where everyone wants to be the senator or a congressman who attacks Mark Zuckerberg, but you're not actually claiming, I don't think, that the majority of the American population has turned anti-tech. I mean, that would be preposterous. However, it would be sad if we were really throwing the baby out with the bathwater, given that these technologies were invented in America, right? And again, we do benefit so much. Maybe what we should do instead is to stop, whether you're a critic or not, stop, appreciate, and quantify, as I try to do, just in which ways we do benefit. Every city hall, every city council, every mayor, every congressman now has a Facebook page. Rather than the halcyon good old days where you had to call your congressman to make a complaint. And of course, no one answered. Today, they respond. They have to, right? They get the messages that says, fix this. We're complaining about this. You can't claim you didn't get the email or the Facebook message. So let's be truthful, honest, and holistic about what constitutes the role of technology in our society. And it's way broader and way better than we think about when we just make these narrow critiques. Right. I certainly think there can be a difference between what people do and uh, the narrative that they have about it. And certainly the narrative uh, that has been blowing up the last couple of years is that, holy crap, this stuff is has gone wrong in many ways that we did not see coming and we don't like. Um, but I think even even beyond that narrative, though, I think that the, the fundamental question that a lot of people in uh, the West worry about is there's an unexpected sort of stress of all the connectivity that we're kind of um, addicted to it, a lot of us. And I asked for a show of hands of the TED audience a few years ago about if you had to choose between letting go of the internet or indoor plumbing, you know, (laughs) which which would go. And um, 
two, two thirds or so of the audience would let go of indoor plumbing first, possibly because they figured they could Google, you know, how to dig your own toilet. Yeah, well, we flush the toilet too much anyway. It's better for the environment. <laughs> but but I, I wonder whether I wonder whether how that vote would go now. Like I suspect it might it might have swung back the other way, at least temporarily. Even though I sometimes hate it, often hate it, I couldn't imagine a life without that connectivity. As you know, more people in India have mobile mobile phones and have access to toilets. <laughs> so clearly humanity is making its choice uh, to some degree. <laughs> and obviously the answer is both and, right? At the end of the day, yeah, we, want, although... we want both. We don't ever cease. And this to me was the most fun part of all the research I've done is to just dig deep into the last, you know, million years of human history it is our human instinct. It is our impulse, right, to want to be connected. So let's talk a bit about your new book and your new thinking. So you've got this new book out called The Future is Asian. What, what's your argument there? What do you mean by that? <laughs> the point of this book was to say that Asia is much bigger than just China. And that's a big gaping hole in the literature. We have 20 years of books that purport to be about Asia, but are basically just about China. There's an assumption that Asia is basically, you know, whatever China wants. China gets what it wants. It gets what it wants everywhere in the world and certainly in its own neighborhood. So who cares what those other people think? But the history of Asia is, you know, four plus thousand years of rich, distinct, vibrant civilizations, dozens of them, that have actually done a very good job of, of maintaining their independence from China. So I wanted to bring life to the Southeast Asian civilizations, Persian civilization, Indian civilization, and so on and so forth, and to show how they have over millennia of Silk Roads had these patterns of commerce, conflict, and culture in their interactions with each other. That actually is a very natural state of affairs for Asia to which it's returning. And why does it matter? Well, Chris, because we're talking about 5 billion people. So, so the demographic piece is pretty well known, that that is where the people are. But um, there's, there's probably an unquestioned assumption by a lot of people in the West that still the majority of uh, economic action is, I mean, America is still by some measures the world's largest economy, strongest military, and that culturally, in many ways, the West still right. leads the world. So what, what do you mean by right. the future? So Asia? first of all, again, I divide the West. I talk about the world being Europeanized in the 19th century, Americanized in the 20th century, and Asianized in the 21st century. The impact of Europe in the world is as deep, as profound as what America achieved in the 20th century. Because if you think about the Europeanization of the world through colonialism, it gave the world much of the, the, the boundaries that it has today. It gave much of the world, you know, European languages languages that they speak, the parliamentary systems that they have that they inherited from the British Empire and so forth, and of course, enlightenment values and so forth. So the Europeanization of the world has still has a profound impact, a lasting impact. Then there's the Americanization of the world in the, in the 20th century, the spread of democracy, freedom, the love of entrepreneurialism, the soft power of America. All those things are profoundly baked into so much of the world today. And all I'm saying is that there's a new layer and one civilization does not displace, destroy, and bury its predecessors. They add a new layer of richness, right? It's just a new layer of soil that is fertilizing, right, our global society. And that's what Asia is doing. And so whether it is the number of people who are learning Chinese or going to study in China, whether it is the, the visibility of Bollywood movies and K-pop music, whether it is yoga, meditation, and mindfulness, and of course, the, the spread of Asian people as diasporas all over the world, right? The number one source of new citizens every year in the United States is Asians, not Latinos, right? So the Asianization of the world is not a challenge culturally to the West. It's just a new layer. And of course, it's happening. So, so you talk about Asianization in general. What does that feel like? So for example, take um, a kid growing up in New York City today, or even in Colorado, where uh, learning Chinese has displaced Spanish as the top language of choice for, for second language study. So you actually grow up learning Chinese on the side, right? Then when it comes to, you know, you're backpacking, uh, you don't just go to Europe, you decide, oh, I'm going to go backpack around Southeast Asia instead. Then when it comes time to 
go to college, you realize, well, actually, these great American universities like uh, Yale or MIT or NYU have campuses in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai and Singapore. So I guess I'll just go there. After all, they're subsidized. They're actually cheaper than studying in the United States, but I get my American education. Then it's, oh, I want to join a startup. However, that startup's biggest market is Asia, right? They really want to sell their apps and technology in Indonesia. So it looks like my first job is going to be in Jakarta. So that's just a composite, generic example, but I can name you hundreds of people who have gone through exactly that pattern. You know, they're the ones I write about. So again, you and I are of a certain age, young Americans today uh, who are growing up, who are teenagers, they already live in a world in which Asia is a huge part of their consciousness. That's all. Do you think that more people in Asia are actually adopting being Asian as part of their identity? Because Asia Asia itself is not, that isn't a term that was invented by... Asians, I no. don't think. Like goes goes back no. to there is no Greece, reason. Right? Like, Absolutely, it was, it was a label put on a part of the exactly. world. Exactly. So and, I'm so and, glad you mentioned it. No, but yeah. so, but so people's identity isn't like traditionally has not been. I'm Asian. It, it might have been, um, you know, I am Tibetan or right. I am Vietnamese. Well, it still very much is but, these rich historical civilizations that have all each viewed themselves as the center of the universe. Why would they also even have bothered to invent a term for this geography that they didn't even measure or quantify or map until Europe gave it a right. name that they also use? So is there a new layer of Asian identity on top of the fact that I'm Indian or I'm Chinese or I'm Persian or Turkish? The answer is becoming yes. And the reason, by the way, is that it's not the first time in history, right? Again, you think about the Silk Roads. It existed 500 years ago before colonialism, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago. Asians had a sense of their common interactions with each other. The spread of cultural learning, the spread of religion, like uh, you know Buddhism, for example, uh, and, and all of these uh, principles and, and values is a circulation across Asians that happened for millennia. No Chinese person is going to say, yeah, I'm Asian, I'm not Chinese. But is there a resurgence of a certain kind of pan-Asian identity and even pride? Absolutely, Chris. Well, you live in Singapore. Yeah. Talk about how people who you interact with in Singapore and elsewhere in Asia, how conscious they are of this is their time. I mean, without a doubt, everywhere I go in Asia, that's what you hear. And by the way, it's not about how rich you are, how poor you are, right? It's about your momentum. It's the sense that we're getting there and we know how to get there. And everything that we could learn from the past experience of Western dominance or tutelage we is baked into our present model. It's just going to take a matter of time, either fast or slow, but we'll get there. We'll be hypermodern. Look how the Chinese did it, the Japanese did it before them, and the Koreans. And when we want to be a smart city, we look at Singapore or we look at um, you know Hong Kong or Seoul or whatever. So Asians have much at this point more to learn from each other than they do from the rest of the world. And again, there's so much evidence of this. You can see it in their diplomacy and the number of new institutions and the cross-border investment, the merging of stock exchanges, the number of tourists and business travelers and students above all. You know, they're just crisscrossing, learning each other's languages, trading with each other at breakneck pace. Parag, uh, one of the criticisms of some of your writing has been that in your in your excitement about what's happened, you know, the recent sort of Asian growth story, that you haven't paid enough attention to the price paid for that sometimes, uh, in particular, the sort of um, extreme authoritarian measures taken by some governments, in, including Singapore, where you live. Yeah. How do you think about that? You've got democracy in the West that's many, many issues exposed by it, I guess, in recent years. You've got governments in Asia, many of which have shown incredible effectiveness in most measures of of development and I would even say like competency, but also some dark things going on. Right. Does the price of progress justify a certain level of authoritarian ruthlessness? Well, authoritarian ruthlessness is not and should not be necessary for progress, right? It certainly hasn't been in Norway, right, (laughs) for example, uh, or or Iceland, uh, for that matter. This is a very common debate in Asia among countries. Do we have to be like the Chinese government in order to achieve what China has? And the answer is no. One should be more disciplined, right, in terms of execution once there is a decision. Once there is a decision that the Indian people should have universal basic income or universal health care, well, then go and do it, right? That's a good thing for the people to have. Don't be corrupt about it the way India is at every possible level of governance, right? But should it be authoritarian? No. Again, authoritarianism has existed around the world. It's uh, acute in some major Asian powers like China. 
But let's be clear that a- more Asians live in democracies than live in non-democracies. You know, in, in the next six months, India, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, and Thailand are all having elections. That's 1.8 billion people. We need to have a system I call direct democracy. I, I actually advocate that every citizen on Earth age 16 and up in every country should have the right to vote and should it should almost be mandatory. But do you have a leadership that's actually going to get things done? And Chris, again, we're talking about billions of poor people in Asia. They want to see, you know, again, uh, health care. They want to see a better educational system. They want to see drugs off their streets. Someone's got to do it. And I don't sympathize with the principle of authoritarianism, but I, in my writing and in my travels, in my interviews, in my research, I go to talk to ordinary Indians and Filipinos and Indonesians, and I understand and I relate to the reader why do they like these leaders? And that's important for us to understand. Yeah. So so let's think about the future. Like, where do you see the world heading? I think you, you I mean, you called yourself, um, was it a functional optimist or an accidental optimist? Oh, accidental optimist, 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 yeah. optimist. Whether it's optimistic or pessimistic, I think we should accept certain trends that I think are fairly irreversible, right? Again, we continue to build out all this connectivity. You know, the world's largest coordinated infrastructure investment plan is rolling out uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And it's not just China, though China started it. Everyone is getting involved in infrastructure finance. Every country is getting more connected to every other country. After Brexit, Britain is on a on a mission to get more connected. Let's be absolutely clear. So whether you claim that your country is against connectivity or a backlash against globalization, once you realize and suffer uh, from cutting off your connectivity, you g- double down and go back to it. So I see the world getting more connected, but let's be clear, there's a very, you know, the, the world's regional systems are getting more deeply connected to each other. So like I said, Asians are trading more with each other. Eurasia is becoming a more and more connected and even integrated mega continent. It is the largest continent in the world. Europe is desperate to have more free trade agreements with Southeast Asia, with India, with Japan. They are doing more of these connectivity initiatives. They trade billions, hundreds of billions more with Asia than America does. So Eurasia is, you know, that's again, you talk about what does the future look like? It's going to be quite Eurasian. It's going to clearly be the center of gravity in the world in the future. And I don't see any turning back from that. What is the right way to run that world? I mean, should should we have in the future, should we have a world where the mayors of mega cities have more power than currently, that maybe that there are key international uh, organizations, decision-making bodies that have power and that and the current national governments should have less power than, than currently? Is that the right future? I don't want to sort of engage us in should because I think that, you know, there is a certain, you know, dynamic evolution that's underway right now. National governments matter a lot. The United States matters a lot. The European Union has a regulatory power. They all seek to govern, obviously, their own domestic affairs and make their own rules and even to export their rules internationally, whether it is, again, European regulations around data protection, for example. But then there's also a layer of international governance, right? The norms and the codes of the World Trade Organization or Commission on uh, Human Rights Council and this kind of thing. And then there's the cities as well, which increasingly help gov- national governments decide what's best for their country, right? And so again, the London view of Brexit contrasts quite considerably with the kind of hinterland view of Brexit, right? So cities are playing a greater and greater role in shaping national policy and international policy. So therefore, you know, when you posit the question is sort of, should this be more powerful than that, be more powerful than that? Well, actually, they're really already influencing each other to a considerable degree. And what we have today is the net result of that that mishmash and fusion of competing and cooperating layers of authority. And that's, in a way, what should be is what is and what is becoming. And all of that plays out at different rates or scales in North America versus Europe versus Africa versus Asia. That's the world we live in. What will the world look like 20, 30 years? Actually, again, if the pop- world population is only going to be 10 billion people and it's going to be spread across these you know, key urban and, and densely populated hubs and areas, there's going to be a real global war for talent. It's like the antithesis of the presumption that we live in this populist xenophobic moment. Cities that have all this wonderful infrastructure right, are going to be competing to have millennials and young people come and live in their city because it'll only be a world of 10 billion people. And what meaning will a city or a country have if it doesn't have people coming in and young people staying there to work there and to make it a great society? A war for talent and then perhaps 
questions and concerns about the people who are less talented and yes. still have to survive somehow. Yeah. And a good government will take care of them as a good government should today. I've, I've often had this conversation with some of my American and, and British friends um, in the last few years when they've been down about the world and bleak about so yeah. much. And uh, kind of said, you know, you know that that's a really parochial <laughs> attitude. Like if you spend some time in Mumbai or Shanghai or any of a thousand other places that aren't the West, you'll, you'll see a very different feeling. You'll see almost everyone feeling that they've got a pretty good. They've certainly got it better than their parents had it. Absolutely. And they have hopes that their children will have a better life still. And um, it's amazing, actually, how many people, even you know, people in the West who maybe don't see that, can actually get joy from that. That I mean, we're all humans after all. And, and if you think, well, wait a minute, maybe actually five billion people in the world really are rising. If you can take the title of your book, The Future is Asian, as being, and I'm, you know, we're all part of the same team right. viewed one way. You can get at least some joy from that, I think. I'm glad that you and I are <laughs> uh, are trying to win converts in the same way. I certainly am as well. It is, it's one conversation at a time, Chris. Uh, it really is. So, Parag, if there was one idea that you could seed into the minds of seven, eight, nine, ten billion 10 billion people, what would that idea be? A s- single idea. You know, I love to corrupt the minds of the world. You, I, I, you know, celebrate mobility. You know, I'm uh, probably benefited from it as much as any human being can. And I think it's extremely important as a component of a young person's resilience today is to be mobile because you really don't know where the job is going to be for you, where the right place to be educated is for you, where your right life partner is going to be. And if you're not connected and you're not mobile, then you are cut off from fulfilling your your dreams, your ambitions, reaching your full potential. So if there are two universal virtues, if you will, that a person ideally has in order to you know make the most of their life, it would be to have some degree of connectivity you know, to be able to choose whether or not they're drowning in it or, you know, a sort of exploiting it and to be mobile. That is the way already the world's youth think. You know, th- there's no such thing even as global citizenship. And yet there are growing percentages of young people in rich countries, poor countries, north, south, east, west, all feel that way. So I actually think, again, pretty clear evidence that we're moving into that world. Well, thank you for this conversation, Prague. It's been really great talking with you. Thank you. Parag Khanna is a global strategist and the author of The Future is Asian, Commerce, Conflict and Culture in the 21st Century. He joined us on the TED stage in 2009 and 2016, as well as at TEDx events. You can listen to his TED Talks at TED.com. This week's show was produced by Megan Tan. Our production manager is Roxanne Hylash. Our mix engineer, David Herman. Our theme music is by Alison Leighton Brown. Special thanks to my colleague, Michelle Quint. If you like this show, please rate us on iTunes. We love to hear your thoughts. Also consider sharing it with anyone interested in the future of the world. I'm Chris Anderson. Thanks so much for listening. (laughs) 